Charles, you from from Ghana? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, we don't have any affiliate on Jason. Welcome, church, as well. It's nice to see. I think there's more people here than there were last time I was here. Am I right? It was on holiday. Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to be back. It's good to be back. Um, I'm happy to be back here, despite just having handed in my thesis. I'm still recovering from that uh it was 10 months just working on the same thing so imagine having to read the same passage in scripture over and over and over and over again <laughs> translating from hebrew and then your head starts to itch uh but it's good to be here with you um and i was glad i made it from the morning uh because usually the trains can be a bit challenging <laughs> when you're coming all the way from new boat <laughs> to a place like this, Folkestone. Mm -hmm. uh, I've yet to visit the beach, but um, I'm hoping someday I'll be able to. But it's good to be back with you. Um, I spoke to, I messaged with Elder Barlett during the week and she told me she wasn't gonna be here uh, today. Uh, let us continue to keep her in our thoughts and prayers. Um, let us just pray quickly before I begin. Uh, Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for bringing me here once again. Um, it's time for you to speak to us, and I pray that you do so in the mighty name I pray, amen. I felt compelled to speak to you about what I'm about to share. As you can see the title, Let God Be Your First Point of Contact. 
uh, because I felt, even though I'm a theology student, at times, God is still not my first point of contact. And there are many good reasons for that. Uh, the demands of university life, the burdens of family and friends, my troubled housemates, you know, sometimes you walk out and they, they have their issues to share with you without even asking them to. <laughs> and you have to listen, right? Uh, dealing with impatient landlords, uh, dealing with my own physical pains, emotional turmoil, etc., etc., etc. And sometimes when you're going through these motions, you forget to just stop and reach out to God first. Uh, can anyone relate or is it just me? Yeah? <laughs> And so it prompted me to read the text my dear friend here uh, read, read to us, Nehemiah uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 4. Then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to God of heaven. He prayed immediately, instantaneously. He reached out to God. The person I want to talk about briefly is, of course, Nehemiah. Uh, the Bible tells us, that Nehemiah was a cupbearer. Uh, when you look at Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11. However, we don't get any explanation of his day to day activities. It's a bit like when you go on Indeed and you're searching for a job. Has anyone been through that experience? Mm -hmm. And you're, you're looking for the job and you find the job, but it doesn't tell you what the job entails, it doesn't tell you what you're going to be doing. Uh, that's kind of what is similar here with Nehemiah when you look at his story. Um, and it's very interesting, a cup bearer, what did he do on a day-to-day -day basis? But I could relate to it in some way, because two summers ago, um, I just finished my first year at Evo, and um, I needed a job. As Brother Arthur said, you know, in his devotion, Jesus had to feed 5,000 people, but students, we also have to eat, right? So I had to find a job, <laughs> finished with a distinction, praise God, needed a job, so I went on Indeed, searched and it took about one month, still wasn't finding anything, and eventually a restaurant called me. They said, hey, you can come over for a trial shift, uh, and then if we like you, you can stay. So I said, okay. I went there hurriedly to begin this job. And within the first week, they were just looking at how I work. And at the end of it, the manager said, you know what, you're all right. <laughs> we're gonna take you on to serve and to help as a food runner. I said, praise God, <laughs> let's begin. And we started. What was good about that job, as our brother shared the testimony, they gave me my Sabbath off as well. And that was excellent, right? So I get to be my theology self, righteous self, and I can still eat some good food, hopefully. It was a nice pizzeria restaurant. So we started, and I was serving and serving and serving. But after about two weeks in the job, I realized the back of my legs were beginning to to fade away <laughs> i was starting to struggle and i said man this is a tough job uh so i went to one of the other workers and i said look my, the back of my thighs are giving up uh, do you have any advice and she said to me look man <laughs> she looked very compassionate you know she looked at me and said look you need to take a very hot bath uh, she didn't speak very good english and that's how she said it. you need to take a hot bath and it will help with a pain and i said really I said okay so what did you think i did that very evening <laughs> i laid the tap water and uh i just laid in there for a while and uh the pain eased a little bit and the next day i was out there again serving people i've never served so many people in my life <laughs> and uh, it was a very interesting experience um but nehemiah had to do something similar and i can relate he had to serve the king and his courtiers. He had to move around a lot. But as time went on, I began to realize that although I started a bit not quite healthy, I started to get healthier because I was moving around a lot. I was serving a lot of people. I was pacing up and down. I was moving hurriedly. Uh, the managers were telling us, come on, man, you need to be quicker. <laughs> you need to serve quicker, you know? You need to move mind, mind, faster. Mind. And so I can imagine Nehemiah was a very strong man he was a fit man he was a man who held a trusted position um, and um, i'm sure he was well appreciated his mind was also sharper because when you move that quickly you're burning all those calories your mind starts to operate quickly right and um, i can imagine he was a very intelligent man and um, one moment came up to me as i was going through the study 
Um, as I got the job got easier, uh, I was standing there just waiting for who else is meant to be served. And one couple looked over to me and said, hey, come on over. So I went over, I wanted to know what was going on. And they said, look, uh, we finished the food, but the food wasn't very good. And I said, what do you mean? It's like, the people here are not nice. Uh, the managers are not nice. We didn't like the food. I said, well, you finished the Yes, but it was still not very good. <laughs> and I was in shock because I was thinking, why, why call me to complain? <laughs> I'm just serving food. Why not call the manager? But they felt the need to call me. And so I listened and I nodded my head like a pigeon. I said, okay, whatever you say. And then they went, okay, it's time to go now. So they left. And I said, okay, I took on the complaint. I listened and I was fervent to them. And I can imagine that Himaya did the same. Serving all these people in the in the court, in the king's court, I can imagine he was good at taking complaints. He was good at listening to people. He was good at managing people. And he was good at making sure everyone was comfortable when he served them good wine. He knew how to maneuver and he knew how to serve the king graciously. Nehemiah was a strong man, but he had a concern. He had a concern. Um, I asked the question though to the church, I don't know if you've ever thought about it. Reading the story of Nehemiah, who was caring for Nehemiah? Nehemiah had this big responsibility of serving everybody, but who was serving him or who was helping him? Um, I heard a saying that strong men uh, do not talk about their emotions. Is that true? It makes them look weak. Is that so? Nehemiah had a vulnerability. And when we read Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11, uh, just before we are told what job he did, it says, O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to my prayer. Uh, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. If you pay attention to the language of this prayer, you can notice that this was a man in distress, actually. He was not okay emotionally. He was serving all these people, but he wasn't very happy. In his season of prayer, he would go to the king with a smile on his face. But within himself, he was hurting. You okay there? Good, good, good. He was uncomfortable. And I can imagine this as a food runner, because when I'll go to work at times, I'll be very tired. <laughs> but I'll be expected to serve every single person. And then the managers will come up to me, Lawrence, why are you, why you got a sad look on your face? You're serving high profile customers. You need to smile. Be positive. Continue on the job. And I could imagine that Himaya was smiling because he was serving the king, but within himself, he had a problem. And who was thinking about his problem? Well, he felt the need to cry out to someone, and he cried out to God. Why the cry to God, as the text was read? Why was he crying out? Well, when we look back in history, within um, Babylonian history, uh, their military, conquered Jerusalem in 586 BC, right? They destroyed that magnificent temple that was built by who? King Solomon. That magnificent temple people to go to to worship God. It was destroyed brick by brick. And Nehemiah came on the scene around 445 BC. He came and he still had this worry that the temple had been destroyed, diminished, and no one was thinking about it anymore. No one was looking to rebuild this temple. His home church was gone. And this was his cry to God. He was crying out to God within his heart that he wanted a replacement. Interesting cry, isn't it? <laughs> Interesting worry. So he was about serving the Persians, uh, King Artaxerxes at Susa, now um, southern Iran. And he was serving, but he was uncomfortable because he was in a strange place in a strange land. He wasn't happy. You can imagine, uh, for those of us who have immigrated here, imagine eating some strange food or going to strange places you're not used to. This was Nehemiah's life every single day. And for almost 141 years after the destruction of the temple, he was still crying out for a replacement. What about us? Do we think we can relate to this cry? Imagine, uh, just imagine, it's a terrible imagination. But imagine this place, you came back next Sabbath and it was not this building anymore. 
the bricks were all gone and you had no place to worship. How would you feel about that? Would you be okay? No. no? Very interesting. We know people in, in places like uh, Gaza who are struggling, right? Let's try and picture how they are feeling at this moment. Nehemiah felt the issue of the broken temple, so much so that he had to cry out. Was his request made known to God? Did God hear his prayer? Mm. I wonder if we are as quick to respond to issues we see in our lives today. Um, the title is, Let God Be Your First Point of Contact, and for a good reason. I think sometimes we may get to it, but we wait a little bit too long, or we are too reluctant mm. to, to get to God. And that's what I wanted to stress this morning, afternoon. Are we often reluctant in our request to God? Do we often think God might not hear us because what we have to say or pray for is insignificant? Can we relate? Do we go to someone else for help before God? <laughs> we might say things like, oh Lord, <laughs> I just came to this strange place, this strange land, and I don't have any connections. So no one might help me if I cry out. So let me be quiet. Or we might say things like, I am too small and insignificant. I'm just a tiny boy in the school being bullied. Um, I'm just going to accept this bullying. Or we might say things like, I am timid and reserved. Um, I'm just going to accept this verbal abuse anyway, because I don't really have much to say. I'm not going to cry out. Or we might say things like, well, Lord, I love my husband, but he keeps hurting me and, you know, I don't have anything to say because he's the main provider of this family. Like, really? Excuses we make not to cry out for help. Nehemiah cried out to God because he knew that he was an important person to God. Maybe in the eyes of all these Persians, like, I mean, I work with Italians, right? And I remember one couple coming in and saying, look, you look like the only person who is just so different from everyone else. <laughs> You're clearly not Italian, right? I said, yeah, I'm not Italian, but I'm serving equally as everyone. And he said, but it's just so odd. You just look so different. <laughs> Why are you working here? And Nehemiah might have felt that same thing, where he was like, he's working with all these Persians. And everyone looked at him differently because he didn't speak their language, didn't sound like everyone else but he was expected to do the same thing. He recognized he was a man of great value in the eyes of God, irrespective of how people saw him in this Persian uh, nation. And so he cherished this God and he mumbled to this God in his heart with his issues, with his problems, with his anxieties. He took it to God first. And that's something I want to stress today that in all things, let us strive to seek God first. Let us not look to what um, separates us from other people or hinders us from our communication with God. Let us take it to God first, anyway, anyhow. Ellen White, uh, the prophet we have benefited so much from, had many challenges in her life. In fact, she even lost one of her children, right? Two. Do we know that? Two. Two of them. All right. Despite all of these challenges, um, would you agree with me that her life was a life of service? Yes. She served all the time. She wrote so many books that we have benefited from. And in one of those books, um, it was compiled in a devotion. And I just want to read something she said here. She entitled it, Lift Him Up as the Son of God during the New Year, January 1st. She wrote, already has the new year been ushered in. Yet before we greet his coming, we pause to ask, what has been the history of the year with his burden of records that has passed on to eternity now? The admonition of the apostle comes down the lines to every one of us. Examine yourselves, 
whether ye be in the faith. Prove yourselves. God forbid that at this important hour we should be so engrossed with other matters as to give no serious, candid, critical self-examination, referring to ourselves. Let things of minor consequence be put in the background, and let us now bring to the front the things which concern our eternal interests. No one of us, in our own strength, can represent the character of Christ, she says. But if Jesus lives in the heart, the spirit dwelling in him will be revealed in us. All our lack will be supplied. I repeat, all our lack will be supplied. Is that something we still believe today? Or we've lost too much, we, we, we don't want to believe it no more. A new year has begun. Uh, the first month is almost gone, right? How many days left? Yeah, more than Three, four? Four days. Four days? Yeah. January is almost gone. My encouragement to each and every one of you is to cultivate a habit of crying out to God first. Do you think we can do that? Yes? No? Maybe so? You know, you could be serving around the church, here in this church, and no one even pays attention to you, am I right? <laughs> I've been here a few times to recognize, and I can see those working fervently for God. But I'm praying and I'm hoping that their reward will come in due time through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should not feel that we are alone in this, in this walk with God. We may neglect everything else, but let's remember that we do not neglect prayer and the communion together with ourselves. Waiting watching and working are to be blended together remember you can't pray all the time and do nothing and you can't do everything and not pray we do it side by side walking together and as a community lifting each other up along with these little children and i just want to give a call out to everyone out there including ourselves to the volunteers uh to teachers to doctors, to cleaners, those who even keep our streets clean, to, to mothers, to fathers, to lawyers, to journalists, to carpenters, to farmers, wow. to the nannies, to the hospitality industry. <laughs> we can be representatives of Jesus today. We shouldn't let the broken system uh, corrupt us into wrongdoing. Shall I repeat? <laughs> we shouldn't let the broken system corrupt us into wrongdoing. We should seek to do the right thing, walk righteously, as Sister Sandra spoke in our Sabbath school. <laughs> we ought to try. Sometimes it's a very good excuse to say, hey, everyone else is doing it. Uh, why should I be different? <laughs> why should I set myself apart from everyone else? But this is the cry from Jesus himself, that we should be set apart from the world. And let us strive to do this. And of course, we can't in our own strength, as we've learned, but by looking unto Jesus, by beholding him, we may become changed. I go back to that very hymn in 99, in closing. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Um, this is the hymn we will close with, um, because I don't know what lies ahead this year in your lives, in my life. <laughs> I don't know. I'm still surprised I made it this far. <laughs> but I'm praying to God that we make him our first point of contact, that we go to him with all our concerns, all our difficulties, all everything that bothers us, anxieties, just take it to him. And then let him direct your path. Let him tell you where to go. Let him tell you who to go to. Let him tell you who to converse with. Let him tell you who to confide in. Go to God first and let him be your guide.